War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Aylmer and Louise Maud. Book 14. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For all information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Patinama. War and Peace. Book 14. Chapter 1. The Battle of Borodino, with the occupation of Moscow that followed it, and the flight of the French without further conflicts, is one of the most instructive phenomena in history. All historians agree that the external activity of states and nations in their conflicts with one another is expressed in wars, and that, as a direct result of greater or less success in war, the political strength of states and nations increases or decreases. Strange as may be the historical account of how some king or emperor, having quarrelled with another, collects an army, fights his enemy's army, gains a victory by killing three, five or ten thousand men, and subjugates a kingdom and an entire nation of several millions, all the facts of history, as far as we know it, confirm the truth of the statement that the greater or lesser success of one army against another is the cause, or at least an essential indication, of an increase or decrease in the strength of the nation, even though it is unintelligible why the defeat of an army, the hundredth part of a nation, should oblige that whole nation to submit. An army gains a victory and, at once, the rights of the conquering nation have increased to the detriment of the defeated. An army has suffered defeat, and at once a people loses its rights in proportion to the severity of the reverse, and if its army suffers a complete defeat, the nation is quite subjugated. So according to history it has been found from the most ancient times, and so it is to our own day. All Napoleon's wars serve to confirm this rule. In proportion to the defeat of the Austrian army, Austria loses its rights, and the rights and the strength of France increase. The victories of the French at Jena and Auerstadt destroy the independent existence of Prussia. But then, in 1812, the French gain a victory near Moscow. Moscow is taken and, after that, with no further battles, it is not Russia that ceases to exist, but the French army of 600,000, and then Napoleonic France itself. To strain the facts to fit the rules of history, to say that the field of battle at Borodino remained in the hands of the Russians, or that after Moscow there were other battles that destroyed Napoleon's army, is impossible. After the French victory at Borodino, there was no general engagement, nor any that were at all serious, yet the French army ceased to exist. What does this mean? If it were an example taken from the history of China, we might say that it was not an historic phenomenon, which is the historian's usual expedient when anything does not fit their standards. If the matter concerns some brief conflict, in which only a small number of troops took part, we might treat it as an exception. But this event occurred before our father's eyes, and for them it was a question of the life or death of their fatherland, and it happened in the greatest of all known wars. The period of the campaign of 1812, from the Battle of Borodino to the expulsion of the French, proved that the winning of a battle does not produce a conquest, and is not even an invariable indication of conquest. It proved that the force which decides the fate of peoples lies not in the conquerors, nor even in armies and battles, but in something else. The French historians, describing the condition of the French army before it left Moscow, affirm that all was in order in the Grand Army, except the cavalry, the artillery and the transport, there was no forage for the horses or the cattle. That was a misfortune no one could remedy, for the peasants of the district burned their hay rather than let the French have it. 
The victory gained did not bring the usual results, because the peasants, Karp and Vlas, who, after the French had evacuated Moscow, drove in their carts to pillage the town, and in general personally failed to manifest any heroic feelings, and the whole innumerable multitude of such peasants did not bring their hay to Moscow for the high price offered them, but burned it instead. Let us imagine two men who have come out to fight a duel with rapiers according to all the rules of the art of fencing. The fencing has gone on for some time. Suddenly, one of the combatants, feeling himself wounded and understanding that a matter is no joke but concerns his life, throws down his rapier and, seizing the first cudgel that comes to hand, begins to brandish it. Then let us imagine that the combatant who so sensibly employed the best and simplest means to attain his end was at the same time influenced by traditions of chivalry and, desiring to conceal the facts of the case, insisted that he had gained his victory with the rapier according to all the rules of art. One can imagine what confusion and obscurity would result from such an account of the duel. The fencer who demanded a contest according to the rules of fencing was the French army. His opponent, who threw away the rapier and snatched up the cudgel, was the Russian people. Those who try to explain the matter according to the rules of fencing are the historians who have described the event. After the burning of Smolensk, a war began which did not follow any previous traditions of war. The burning of towns and villages, the retreats after battles, the blow dealt at Borodino, and the renewed retreat, the burning of Moscow, the capture of marauders, the seizure of transports, and the guerrilla war were all departures from the rules. Napoleon felt this, and from the time he took up the correct fencing attitude in Moscow, and instead of his opponent's rapier saw a cudgel raised above his head, he did not cease to complain to Kutuzov and to the Emperor Alexander that the war was being carried on contrary to all the rules, as if there were any rules for killing people. In spite of the complaints of the French as to the non-observance of the rules, in spite of the fact that to some highly placed Russians it seemed rather disgraceful to fight with the cudgel and they wanted to assume a pose en carte or en tierce according to all the rules and to make an adroit thrust en prime and so on, the cudgel of the people's war was lifted with all its menacing and majestic strength and without consulting anyone's tastes or rules and regardless of anything else it rose and fell with stupid simplicity, but consistently, and belaboured the French till the whole invasion had perished. And it is well for a people who do not, as the French did in 1813, salute according to all the rules of art, and, presenting the hilt of the rapier gracefully and politely, hand it to their magnanimous conqueror, but at the moment of trial, without asking what rules others have adopted in similar cases, simply and easily pick up the first cudgel that comes to hand and strike with it, till the feeling of resentment and revenge in their soul yields to a feeling of contempt and compassion. End of chapter 1 Recording by Ernst Patinama War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 2, read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. One of the most obvious and advantageous departures from the so-called laws of war is the action of scattered groups against men pressed together in a mass. Such action always occurs in wars that take on a national character. In such actions, instead of two crowds opposing each other, the men disperse, attack singly, run away when attacked by stronger forces, but again attack when opportunity offers. This was done by the guerrillas in Spain, by the mountain tribes in the Caucasus, and by the Russians in 1812. People have called this kind of war guerrilla warfare, and assume that by so calling it, they have explained its meaning. But such a war does not fit in under any rule, and is directly opposed to a well-known rule of tactics which is accepted as infallible. That rule says that an attacker should concentrate his forces in order to be stronger than his opponent at the moment of conflict. 
Guerrilla war, always successful as history shows, directly infringes that rule. This contradiction arises from the fact that military science assumes the strength of an army to be identical with its numbers. Military science says that the more troops, the greater the strength. Les gros bataillons ont toujours raison. Large battalions are always victorious. For military science to say this is like defining momentum in mechanics by reference to the mass only, stating that momenta are equal or unequal to each other simply because the masses involved are equal or unequal. Momentum, quantity of motion, is the product of mass and velocity. In military affairs, the strength of an army is the product of its mass and some unknown X. Military science, seeing in history innumerable instances of the fact that the size of any army does not coincide with its strength, and that small detachments defeat larger ones, obscurely admits the existence of this unknown factor and tries to discover it, now in a geometric formation, now in the equipment employed, now, and most usually, in the genius of the commanders. But the assignment of these various meanings to the factor does not yield results which accord with the historic facts. Yet it is only necessary to abandon the false view, adopted to gratify the heroes, of the efficacy of the directions issued in wartime by commanders, in order to find this unknown quantity. That unknown quantity is the spirit of the army, that is to say, the greater or lesser readiness to fight and face danger felt by all the men composing an army, quite independently of whether they are, or are not, fighting under the command of a genius, in two or three line formation, with cudgels or with rifles that repeat thirty times a minute. Men who want to fight will always put themselves in the most advantageous conditions for fighting. The spirit of an army is the factor which, multiplied by the mass, gives the resulting force. To define and express the significance of this unknown factor, the spirit of an army, is a problem for science. This problem is only solvable if we cease, arbitrarily, to substitute for the unknown X itself the conditions under which that force becomes apparent, such as the commands of the general, the equipment employed, and so on, mistaking these for the real significance of the factor. And if we recognize this unknown quantity in its entirety as being the greater or lesser desire to fight and to face danger, only then, expressing known historic facts by equations and comparing the relative significance of this factor, can we hope to define the unknown. Ten men, battalions, or divisions, fighting fifteen men, battalions, or divisions, conquer, that is, kill or take captive, all the others, while themselves losing four, so that on the one side, four, and on the other, fifteen were lost. Consequently, the four were equal to the fifteen, and therefore, 4x equals 15y. Consequently, x over y equals 15 over 4. This equation does not give us the value of the unknown factor, but gives us a ratio between two unknowns. And by bringing variously selected historic units, battles, campaigns, periods of war, into such equations, a series of numbers could be obtained in which certain laws should exist and might be discovered. The tactical rule that an army should act in masses when attacking, and in smaller groups in retreat, unconsciously confirms the truth that the strength of an army depends on its spirit. To lead men forward under fire, more discipline, obtainable only by movement in masses, is needed than is needed to resist attacks. But this rule, which leaves out of account the spirit of the army, continually proves incorrect, and is in particularly striking contrast to the facts when some strong rise or fall in the spirit of the troops occurs, as in all national wars. The French, retreating in 1812, though according to tactics they should have separated into detachments to defend themselves, congregated into a mass because the spirit of the army had so fallen that only the mass held the army together. The Russians, on the contrary, ought, according to tactics, to have attacked in mass, but in fact they split up into small units, because their spirit had so risen that separate individuals, without orders, dealt blows at the French without needing any compulsion to induce them to expose themselves to hardships and dangers. End of chapter 2. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 3 read for LibriVox.org by Neil Donnelly. The so-called partisan war began with the entry of the French into Smolensk. 
Before partisan warfare had been officially recognized by the government, thousands of enemy stragglers, marauders, and foragers had been destroyed by the Cossacks and the peasants, who killed them off as instinctively as dogs worry a stray mad dog to death. Denis Davidov, with his Russian instinct, was the first to recognize the value of this terrible cudgel which, regardless of the rules of military science, destroyed the French, and to him belongs the credit for taking the first step toward regularizing this method of warfare. On August 24, Davidov's first partisan detachment was formed, and then others were recognized. The further the campaign progressed, the more numerous these detachments became. The irregulars destroyed the great army piecemeal. They gathered the fallen leaves that dropped of themselves from that withered tree, the French army, and sometimes shook that tree itself. By October, when the French were fleeing toward Smolensk, there were hundreds of such companies of various sizes and characters. There were some that adopted all the army methods and had infantry, artillery, staffs, and the comforts of life. Others consisted solely of Cossack cavalry. There were also small scratch groups of foot and horse and groups of peasants and landowners that remained unknown. A sacristan commanded one party which captured several hundred prisoners in the course of a month. And there was Vasilisa, the wife of a village elder who slew hundreds of the French. The partisan warfare flamed up most fiercely in the latter days of October. Its first period had passed, when the partisans themselves, amazed at their own boldness, feared every minute to be surrounded and captured by the French, and hid in the forests without unsaddling, hardly daring to dismount, and always expecting to be pursued. By the end of October this kind of warfare had taken definite shape. It had become clear to all what could be ventured against the French and what could not. Now only the commanders of detachments with staffs and moving according to rules at a distance from the French still regarded many things as impossible. The small bands that had started their activities long before and had already observed the French closely considered things possible which the commanders of the big detachments did not dare to contemplate. The Cossacks and peasants who crept in among the French now considered everything possible. On October 22, Denisov, who was one of the irregulars, was with his group at the height of the guerrilla enthusiasm. Since early morning, he and his party had been on the move. All day long, he had been watching from the forest that skirted the high road a large French convoy of cavalry baggage and Russian prisoners separated from the rest of the army, which, as was learned from spies and prisoners, was moving under a strong escort to Smolensk. Besides Denisov and Dolokhov, who also led a small party and moved in Denisov's vicinity, the commanders of some large divisions with staffs also knew of this convoy, and as Denisov expressed it, were sharpening their teeth for it. Two of the commanders of large parties, one a Pole and the other a German, sent invitations to Denisov almost simultaneously, requesting him to join up with their divisions to attack the convoy. No, brother, I have grown mustaches myself, said Denisov on reading these documents and he wrote to the German that, despite his heartfelt desire to serve under so valiant and renowned a general, he had to forego that pleasure because he was already under the command of the Polish general. To the Polish general he replied to the same effect, informing him that he was already under the command of the German. Having arranged matters thus, Denisov and Dolokhov intended, without reporting matters to the higher command, to attack and seize that convoy with their own small forces. On October 22, it was moving from the village of Mikulino to that of Shamshevo. To the left of the road between Mikulino and Shamshevo, there were large forests, extending in some places up to the road itself, though in others a mile or more back from it. Through these forests, Denisov and his party rode all day, sometimes keeping well back in them and sometimes coming to the very edge, but never losing sight of the moving French. That morning, Cossacks of Denisov's party had seized and carried off into the forest two wagons loaded with cavalry saddles, which had stuck in the mud not far from Mikulino, where the forest ran close to the road. Since then, and until evening, the party had the movements of the French without attacking. It was necessary to let the French reach Shamshevo quietly without alarming them, and then, 
After joining Dolokhov, who was to come that evening to a consultation at a watchman's hut in the forest less than a mile from Shamchevo, to surprise the French at dawn, falling like an avalanche on their heads from two sides, and rout and capture them all at one blow. In their rear, more than a mile from Mikulino, where the forest came right up to the road, six Cossacks were posted to report if any fresh columns of French should show themselves. Beyond the Shamchevo, Delacroix was to observe the road in the same way, to find out at what distance there were other French troops. They reckoned that the convoy had 1,500 men. Denisov had 200, and Dolokhov might have as many more, but the disparity of numbers did not deter Denisov. All that he now wanted to know was what troops these were, and to learn that he had to capture a tongue, that is, a man from the enemy column. That morning's attack on the wagons had been made so hastily that the Frenchmen with the wagons had all been killed. Only a little drummer boy had been taken alive, and as he was a straggler, he could tell them nothing definite about the troops in that column. Denisov considered it dangerous to make a second attack, for fear of putting the whole column on the alert. So he sent Tikhan Sherbati, a peasant of his party, to Shamchevo to try and seize at least one of the French quartermasters who had been sent on in advance. End of chapter 3 War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 4, read for LibriVox.org by Sunny Shields. It was a warm, rainy autumn day. The sky and the horizon were both the colour of muddy water. At times a sort of mist descended, and then suddenly heavy slanting rain came down. Denisov, in a felt cloak and a sheepskin cap, from which the rain ran down, was riding a thin thoroughbred horse with sunken sides. Like his horse, which turned its head and laid its ears back, he shrank from the driving rain and gazed anxiously before him. His thin face, with its short, thick black beard, looked angry. Beside Denisov rode an Esso, Denisov's fellow worker, also in felt cloak and sheepskin cap and riding a large, sleek Don horse. Esau Levaisky III was a tall man, as straight as an arrow, pale-faced, fair-haired, with narrow, light eyes, and with calm self-satisfaction on his face and bearing. Though it was impossible to say in what the peculiarity of the horse and rider lay, yet at first glance at the Esau and Denisov, one saw that the latter was wet and uncomfortable, and was a man mounted on a horse. While looking at the Esau, one saw that he was as comfortable and as much at ease as always, and that he was not a man who had mounted a horse, but a man who was one with his horse, a being consequently possessed of twofold strength. A little ahead of them walked a peasant guide, wet to the skin and wearing a grey peasant coat and a white knitted cap. A little behind, on a poor, small, lean Kyrgyz mount, with an enormous tail and mane and a bleeding mouth, rode a young officer in a blue French overcoat. Beside him rode an hussar with a boy in a tattered French uniform and blue cap behind him on the crupper of his horse. The boy held on to the hussar with cold, red hands, and raising his eyebrows gazed about him with surprise. This was the French drummer boy, captured that morning. Behind them, along the narrow, sodden, cut-up forest road, came hussars in threes and fours, and then Cossacks, some in felt cloaks, some in French greatcoats, and some with horse cloths over their heads. The horses, being drenched by the rain, all looked black with a chestnut or bay. Their necks, with their wet, close-clinging manes, looked strangely thin. Steam rose from them. Clothes, saddles, reins were all wet, slippery and sodden like the ground and the fallen leaves that strewed the road. The men sat huddled up, trying not to stir, so as to warm the water that had trickled to their bodies and not admit the fresh cold water that was leaking in under their seats, their knees and at the back of their necks. 
In the midst of the outspread line of Cossacks, two wagons, drawn by French horses and by saddled Cossack horses that had been hitched on in front, rumbled over the tree stumps and branches and splashed through the water that lay in the ruts. Denisov's horse swerved aside to avoid a pool in the track and bumped his rider's knee against a tree. Oh, the devil! exclaimed Denisov angrily, and showing his teeth, he struck his horse three times with his whip, splashing himself and his comrades with mud. Denisov was out of sorts, both because of the rain and also from hunger. None of them had eaten anything since morning. And yet more because he still had no news from Dolokhov, and the man sent to capture a tongue had not returned. There'll hardly be another chance to fall on a transport as today. It's too risky to attack them by oneself, and if we put it off till another day, one of the big guerrilla detachments will snatch the prey from under our noses, thought Denisov, continually peering forward, hoping to see a messenger from Dolokhov. On coming to a path in the forest along which he could see far to the right, Denisov stopped. There's someone coming, said he. The ESO looked in the direction Denisov indicated. There are two, an officer and a Cossack. But it is not presupposable that it is the lieutenant colonel himself, said the ESO, who was fond of using words that Cossacks did not know. The approaching riders, having descended a decline, were no longer visible, but they reappeared a few minutes later. In front, at a weary gallop and using his leather whip, rode an officer, dishevelled, and drenched, whose trousers had worked up to above his knees. Behind him, standing in the stirrups, trotted a Cossack. The officer, a very young lad with a broad, rosy face and keen, merry eyes, galloped up to Denisov and handed him a sodden envelope. From the general, said the officer, please excuse its not being quite dry. Denisov, frowning, took the envelope and opened it. There, they kept telling us, it's dangerous, it's dangerous, said the officer, addressing the ESOL, while Denisov was reading the dispatch. But Komarov and I, he pointed to the Cossack, were prepared. We have each of us two pistols. But what's this? he asked, noticing the French drummer boy. A prisoner? You've already been in action? May I speak to him? Rostov! Petya! exclaimed Denisov, having run through the dispatch. Why didn't you say who you were? And turning with a smile, he held out his hand to the lad. The officer was Petya Rostov. All the way, Petya had been preparing himself to behave with Denisov as befitted a grown-up man and an officer, without hinting at their previous acquaintance. But as soon as Denisov smiled at him, Petya brightened up, blushed with pleasure, forgot the official manner he had been rehearsing, and began telling him how he had already been in a battle near Vyazma, and how a certain Hussar had distinguished himself there. Well, I am glad to see you, Denisov interrupted him and his face again assumed its anxious expression. Marco Fioklitich, said he to the assault, this is again from that German. You know, he, he indicated Petya, is serving under him. And Denisov told the assault that the dispatch just delivered was a repetition of the German general's demand that he should join forces with him for an attack on the transport. If we don't take it tomorrow, he'll snatch it from under our noses, he added. While Denisov was talking to the ESOL, Petya, abashed by Denisov's cold tone and supposing it was due to the condition of his trousers, furtively tried to pull them down under his greatcoat so that no one should notice it, while maintaining as martial an air as possible. Will there be any orders, Your Honour? he asked Denisov, holding his hand at the salute and resuming the game of adjutant and general for which he had prepared himself. Or shall I remain with Your Honour? Orders? Denisov repeated thoughtfully. But can you stay till tomorrow? Oh, please, may I stay with you? cried Petya. But just what did the general tell you? To return at once? asked Denisov. Petya blushed. He gave me no instructions. I think I could. He returned, inquiringly. Well, all right, said Denisov. And turning to his men, he directed a party to go up to the halting place arranged near the watchman's hut in the forest and told the officer on the Kyrgyz horse, who performed the duties of an adjutant,
to go and find out where Dolokhov was and whether he would come that evening. Denisov himself intended to go with the Esol and Petya to the edge of the forest where it reached out to Shimshevo to have a look at the part of the French bivouac they were to attack the next day. Well, old fellow, he said to the peasant guide, lead us to Shimshevo. Denisov, Petya and the Esol, accompanied by some Cossacks and the Hussar who had the prisoner, rode to the left across a ravine to the edge of the forest. End of chapter 4 Recorded by Sunny Shields This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 5, read for LibriVox.org by Jeff Dugweiler. The rain had stopped, and only the mist was falling in drops from the trees. Denisov, the Esau, and Petya rode silently, following the peasant in the knitted cap who, stepping lightly with outturned toes and moving noiselessly in his bash shoes over the roots and wet leaves, silently led them to the edge of the forest. He ascended an incline, stopped, looked about him, and advanced to where the screen of trees was less dense. On reaching a large oak tree that had not yet shed its leaves, he stopped and beckoned mysteriously to them with his hand. Denisov and Petya rode up to him. From the spot where the peasant was standing, they could see the French. Immediately beyond the forest, on a downward slope, lay a field of spring rye. To the right, beyond a steep ravine, was a small village and a landowner's house with a broken roof. In the village, in the house, in the garden, by the well, by the pond, over all the rising ground and all along the road uphill from the bridge leading to the village, not more than five hundred yards away, crowds of men could be seen through the shimmering mist. Their own Russian shouting at their horses, which were straining uphill with the carts, and their calls to one another could be clearly heard. Bring the prisoner here, said Denisov in a low voice, not taking his eyes off the French. A Cossack dismounted, lifted the boy down, and took him to Denisov. Pointing to the French troops, Denisov asked him what these and those of them were. The boy, thrusting his cold hands into his pockets and lifting his eyebrows, looked at Denisov in a fright, but in spite of an evident desire to say all he knew, gave confused answers, merely assenting to everything Denisov asked him. Denisov turned away from him, frowning and addressed the Esau, conveying his own conjectures to him. Petya, rapidly turning his head, looked now at the drummer boy, now at Denisov, now at the Esau, and now at the French in the village and along the road, trying not to miss anything of importance. Whether Dolokhov comes or not, we must seize it, eh? said Denisov, with a merry sparkle in his eyes. It is a very suitable spot, said the Esau. We'll send the infantry down by the swamps, Denisov continued. They'll creep up to the garden. You'll wide up from there. Uh, with the Cossacks, he pointed to a spot in the forest beyond the village, and I with my hussars from there, and at the signal shot. The hollow is impassable, there's a swamp there, said the Esau. The horses would sink. We must ride round more to the left. While they were talking in undertones, the crack of a shot sounded from the low ground by the pond. A puff of white smoke appeared, then another, and the sound of hundreds of seemingly merry French voices shouting together came up from the slope. For a moment Denisov and the Esau drew back. They were so near that they thought they were the cause of the firing and shouting, but the firing and shouting did not relate to them. Down below a man wearing something red was running through the marsh. The French were evidently firing and shouting at him. Why, well, that's our Tikon, said the Esau. So it is, it is. The wascal, said Denisov. You'll get away, said the Esau, screwing up his eyes. The man whom they called Tikon, having run to the stream, plunged in so that the water splashed in the air and, having disappeared for an instant, scrambled out on all fours, all black with the wet, and ran on. The French, who had been pursuing him, stopped. Smart that, said the Esau. What a beast, up with his former look of vexation. What has he been doing all this time? Who is he? asked Petya. He's our Plaston. I sent him to capture a tongue. Oh, yes, said Petya, nodding at the first words Denisov uttered as if he understood it all, though he really did not understand anything of it. Tikhan Shashurbadi was one of the most indispensable men in their band. 
He was a peasant from Pokrovsk, near the river Gzat. When Denisov had come to Pokrovsk at the beginning of his operations, and had, as usual, summoned the village elder, and asked him what he knew about the French, the elder, as though shielding himself, had replied, as all village elders did, that he had neither seen nor heard anything of them. But when Denisov explained that his purpose was to kill the French, and asked if no French had strayed that way, the elder replied that some more orderers had really been at the village, but that Tikhon Shushurbati was the only man who dealt with such matters. Denisov had Tikhon called, and, having praised him for his activity, said a few words in the elder's presence about loyalty to the Tsar and the country and the hatred of the French that all sons of the fatherland should cherish. We don't do the French any harm, said Tikhon, evidently frightened by Denisov's words. We only fool about with the lads for fun, you know. We killed a score or so of more orderers, but we did no harm else. Next day, when Denisov had left Pokrovsk, having quite forgotten about this peasant, it was reported to him that Tikhon had attached himself to their party and asked to be allowed to remain with it. Denisov gave orders to let him do so. Tikhon, who at first did rough work laying campfires, fetching water, flaying dead horses, and so on, soon showed a great liking and aptitude for partisan warfare. At night he would go out for booty and always brought back French clothing and weapons, and when told to, would bring in French captives also. Denisov then relieved him from drudgery and began taking him with him when he went out on expeditions, and had him enrolled among the Cossacks. Tikhon did not like riding and always went on foot, never lagging behind the cavalry. He was armed with a musketoon, which he carried rather as a joke, a pike and an axe, which latter he used as a wolf uses its teeth with equal case, picking fleas out of its fur or crunching thick bones. Tikhon, with equal accuracy, would split logs with blows at an arm's length, or holding the head of the axe would cut thin little pegs or carve spoons. In Denisov's party, he held a peculiar and exceptional position. When anything particularly difficult or nasty had to be done, to push a cart out of the mud with one's shoulders, pull a horse out of a swamp by its tail, skin it, slink in among the French, or walk more than 30 miles in a day, everyone pointed laughingly at Tikhon. He won't hurt that devil. He's as strong as a horse, they said of him. Once a Frenchman, Tikhon, was trying to capture, fired a pistol at him and shot him in the fleshy part of the back, that wound which Tikhon treated only with internal and external applications of vodka, was the subject of the liveliest jokes by the whole detachment, jokes in which Tikhon readily joined. Hello, mate, never again? Gave you a twist? The Cossacks would banter him, and Tikhon, purposely writhing and making faces, pretended to be angry and swore at the French with the funniest curses. The only effect of this incident on Tikhon was that, after being wounded, he seldom brought in prisoners. He was the bravest and most useful man in the party. No one found more opportunities for attacking, no one captured or killed more Frenchmen, and consequently he was made the buffoon of all the Cossacks and Hussars and willingly accepted that role. Now he had been sent by Denisov overnight to Shemshivo to capture a tongue. But whether because he had not been content to take only one Frenchman, or because he had slept through the night, he had crept by day into some bushes right among the French, and, as Denisov had witnessed from above, had been detected by them. End of chapter 5 This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 6, read for LibriVox.org by Jeff Dugweiler. After talking for some time with the Esau about the next day's attack, which now, seeing how near they were to the French, he seemed to have definitely decided on, Denisov turned his horse and rode back. Now, my lad, we'll go and get Dwy, he said to Petya. As they approached the watch house, Denisov stopped, peering into the forest. Among the trees, a man with long legs and long, swinging arms, wearing a short jacket, bashed shoes, and a Kazan hat, was approaching with long, light steps. He had a musketoon over his shoulder and an axe stuck in his girdle. 
When he espied Denisov, he hastily threw something into the bushes, removed his sodden hat by its floppy brim, and approached his commander. It was Tikhon. His wrinkled and pockmarked face and narrow little eyes beamed with self-satisfied merriment. He lifted his head high and gazed at Denisov as if repressing a laugh. "'Well, where do you disappear to?' inquired Denisov. "'Where did I disappear to? I went to get Frenchmen,' answered Tikhon boldly and hurriedly, in a husky but melodious bass voice. "'Why did you push yourself in there by daylight? You ass! Well, why haven't you taken one?' "'Oh, I took one all right,' said Tikhon. "'Where is he?' "'You see, I took him first thing at dawn,' Tikhon continued, spreading out his flat feet with outturned toes in their bass shoes. I took him into the forest, and then I see he's no good and think I'll go and fetch a likelier one. You see, what a woke. It's just as I thought, said Denisov to the Esau. Why didn't you bring that one? What was the good bringing him? Tikhon interrupted hastily and angrily. That one wouldn't have done for you, as if I don't know what sort you want. What a brute you are. Well... Uh, I went for another one, Tikhon continued, and I crept like this through the wood and lay down. He suddenly lay down on his stomach with a supple movement to show how he had done it. One turned up and I grabbed him like this. He jumped up quickly and lightly. Come along to the colonel, I said. He starts yelling and suddenly there are four of them. They rushed at me with their little swords, so I went for them with my axe this way. What are you up to, says I. Christ be with you, shouted Tikhon, waving his arms with an angry scowl and throwing out his chest. Yes, we saw from the hill how you took to your heels through the puddles, said the Esau, screwing up his glittering eyes. Petya badly wanted to laugh, but noticed that they all refrained from laughing. He turned his eyes rapidly from Tikhon's face to the Esau's and Denisov's, unable to make out what it all meant. Don't play the fool, said Denisov, coughing angrily. Why didn't you bring the first one? Tikhon scratched his back with one hand and his head with the other. Then suddenly his whole face expanded into a beaming, foolish grin, disclosing a gap where he had lost a tooth. That was why he was called Shashorbati, the gap-toothed. Denisov smiled and Petya burst into a peal of merry laughter in which Tikhon himself joined. Oh, but he was a regular good-for-nothing, said Tikhon. The clothes on him, poor stuff. How could I bring him? It's so rude, your honor. Why, he says, I'm a general's son myself. I won't go, he says. You are a brute, said Denisov. I wanted to question. Oh, but I question him, said Tikhon. He said he didn't know much. There are a lot of us, he says, but all poor stuff, only soldiers in name, he says. Shout loud at them, he says, and you'll take them all. Tikhon concluded, looking cheerfully and resolutely into Denisov's eyes. I'll give you a hundred sharp lashes. That'll teach you to play the fool, said Denisov severely. But why are you angry, remonstrated Tikhon, just as if I had never seen your Frenchman. Only wait till it gets dark and I'll fetch you any of them you want, three if you like. Well, let's go, said Denisov, and rode all the way to the watch house in silence and frowning angrily. Tikhon followed behind, and Petya heard the Cossacks laughing with him and at him about some pair of boots he had thrown into the bushes. When the fit of laughter that had seized him at Tikhon's words and smile had passed, and Petya realized for a moment that this Tikhon had killed a man, he felt uneasy. He looked around at the captive drummer boy and felt a pang in his heart. But this uneasiness lasted only a moment. He felt it necessary to hold his head higher, to brace himself and to question the Esau with an air of importance about tomorrow's undertaking, that he might not be unworthy of the company in which he found himself. The officer who had been sent to inquire met Denisov on the way with the news that Dolokhov was soon coming, and that all was well with him. Denisov at once cheered up, and calling Petya to him, said, Well, tell me about yourself. End of chapter 6 This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 7, read for LibriVox.org by Jeff Dugwiler. Petya, having left his people after their departure from Moscow, joined his regiment, 
and was soon taken as orderly by a general commanding a large guerrilla detachment. From the time he received his commission, and especially since he had joined the active army and taken part in the Battle of Vyazma, Petya had been in a constant state of blissful excitement at being grown up and in a perpetual ecstatic hurry not to miss any chance to do something really heroic. He was highly delighted with what he saw and experienced in the army, but at the same time, it always seemed to him that the really heroic exploits were being performed just where he did not happen to be, and he was always in a hurry to get where he was not. When on the 21st of October, his general expressed a wish to send somebody to Denisov's detachment, Petra begged so piteously to be sent that the general could not refuse. But when dispatching him, he recalled Petra's mad action at the Battle of Vyazma, where instead of riding by the road to the place to which he had been sent, he galloped to the advanced line under the fire of the French, and had there twice fired his pistol. So now the general explicitly forbade his taking part in any action whatever of Denisov's. That was why Petya had blushed and grown confused when Denisov asked him whether he could stay. Before they had ridden to the outskirts of the forest, Petya had considered he must carry out his instructions strictly and return at once. But when he saw the French and saw Tikhon and learned that there would certainly be an attack that night, he decided with the rapidity which with young people changed their views that the general, whom he had greatly respected till then, was a rubbishy German, that Denisov was a hero, that he saw a hero, and Tikhon a hero too, and that it would be shameful for him to leave them in a moment of difficulty. It was already growing dusk when Denisov, Petya, and the Esau rode up to the watch house. In the twilight, saddled horses could be seen, and Cossacks and Hussars who had rigged up rough shelters in the glade and were kindling glowing fires in a hollow of the forest where the French could not see the smoke. In the passage of the small watch house, a Cossack with sleeves rolled up was chopping some mutton. In the room, three officers of Denisov's band were converting a door into a tabletop. Petya took off his wet clothes, gave them to be dried, and at once began helping the officers to fix up the dinner table. In ten minutes, the table was ready and a napkin spread on it. On the table were vodka, a flask of rum, white bread, roast mutton, and salt. Sitting at table with the officers and tearing the fat, savory mutton with his hands, down which the grease trickled, Petra was in an ecstatic, childish state of love for all men, and consequently of confidence that others loved him in the same way. So then what do you think, Vasily Dmitrich? said he to Denisov. It's all right my staying a day with you? And not waiting for a reply, he answered his own question. You see, I was told to find out. Well, I am finding out, only do let me into the very, into the chief. I don't want a reward, but I want... Petra clenched his teeth and looked around, throwing back his head and flourishing his arms. Into the very chief, Denisov repeated with a smile. Only, please let me command something, so that I may really command, Petra went on. What would it be to you? Oh, you want a knife, he said, turning to an officer who wished to cut himself a piece of mutton. And he handed him his clasp knife. The officer admired it. Please keep it, I have several like it, said Petra, blushing. Heavens, I was quite forgetting, he suddenly cried. I have some raisins, fine ones, you know, seedless ones. We have a new sutler, and he has such capital things. I bought ten pounds. I am used to something sweet. Would you like some? And Petra ran out into the passage to his Cossack, and brought back some bags which contained about five pounds of raisins. Have some, gentlemen, have some. You want a coffee pot, don't you? He asked the Esau. I bought a capital one from our sutler. He has splendid things, and he's very honest. That's the chief thing. I'll be sure to send it to you. Perhaps your flints are giving out or are worn out. That happens sometimes, you know. I have brought some with me. Here they are. And he showed a bag. A hundred flints. I bought them very cheap. Please take as many as you want, or all if you like. Then suddenly, dismayed lest he had said too much, Petya stopped and blushed. He tried to remember whether he had not done anything else that was foolish. And running over the advance of the day, he remembered the French drummer boy. It's capital for us here, but what of him? Where have they put him? Have they fed him? Haven't they hurt his feelings? He thought, but having caught himself saying too much about the flints, he was now afraid to speak out. 
I might ask, he thought, but they'll say, he's a boy himself, and so he pities the boy. I'll show them tomorrow whether I'm a boy. Will it seem odd if I ask, Petra thought? Well, never mind. And immediately, blushing and looking anxiously at the officers to see if they appeared ironical, he said, May I call in that boy who was taken prisoner and give him something to eat? Perhaps... Uh, Yes, he's a poor little fellow, said Denisov, who evidently saw nothing shameful in this reminder. Call him in. His name is Vincent Bosse. Have him fetched. I'll call him, said Petya. Yes, yes, call him. A poor little fellow, Denisov repeated. Petya was standing at the door when Denisov said this. He slipped in between the officers, came close to Denisov, and said, Let me kiss you, dear old fellow. Oh, how fine, how splendid. And having kissed Denisov, he ran out of the hut. Basse, Vincent, Petra cried, stopping outside the door. Who do you want, sir? asked a voice in the darkness. Petra replied that he wanted the French lad who had been captured that day. Ah, Viceni, said a Cossack. Vincent, the boy's name, had already been changed by the Cossacks into Viceni, Vernal, and into Visenya by the peasants and soldiers. In both these adaptations, the reference to spring, Vesna, matched the impression made by the young lad. He is warming himself there by the bonfire. Oh, Visenya, Visenya, Viseni! Laughing voices were heard calling to one another in the darkness. He's a smart lad, said a hussar, standing near Petya. We gave him something to eat a while ago. He was awfully hungry. The sound of bare feet splashing through the mud was heard in the darkness, and a, the drummer boy came to the door. Ah, c'est vous, said Petya. Voulez-vous manger? N'ayez pas pu, on ne vous ferait pas de mal. Footnote. Ah, it's you. Do you want something to eat? Don't be afraid. They won't hurt you. End of footnote. He added shyly and affectionately, touching the boy's hand. Entrez, entrez. Footnote. Come in, come in. End footnote. Merci, monsieur. Footnote. Thank you, sir. End footnote. Said the drummer boy in a trembling, almost childish voice, and he began scraping his dirty feet on the threshold. There were many things Petya wanted to say to the drummer boy, but did not dare to. He stood irresolutely behind him in the passage. Then in the darkness, he took the boy's hand and pressed it. Come in, come in, he repeated in a gentle whisper. Oh, what can I do for him, he thought, and opening the door, he let the boy pass in first. When the boy had entered the hut, Petya sat down at a distance from him, considering it beneath his dignity to pay attention to him. But he fingered the money in his pocket and wondered whether it would seem ridiculous to give some to the drummer boy. End of chapter 7 This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 8, read for LibriVox.org. The arrival of Dolokhov diverted Petya's attention from the drummer boy, to whom Dienisov had had some mutton and vodka given, and whom he had dressed in a Russian coat so that he might be kept with their band and not sent away with the other prisoners. Petya had heard in the army many stories of Dolokhov's extraordinary bravery and of his cruelty to the French, so from the moment he entered the hut, Petya did not take his eyes from him, but braced himself up more and more and held his head high that he might not be unworthy of even such company. Dolokhov's appearance amazed Petya by its simplicity. Denisov wore a Cossack coat, had a beard, had an icon of Nicholas the Wonder Worker on his breast, and his way of speaking and everything he did indicated his unusual position. But Dolokhov, who in Moscow had worn a Persian costume, had now the appearance of a most correct officer of the guards. He was clean-shaven and wore a guardsman's padded coat with the Order of St. George at his buttonhole and a plain forage cap set straight on his head. He took off his wet felt cloak in a corner of the room and without greeting anyone went up to Denisov and began questioning him about the matter in hand. Denisov told him of the designs the large detachments had on the transport, of the message Petya had brought, and his own replies to both generals. Then he told him all he knew of the French detachment. "'That's so, but we must know what troops they are and their numbers,' said Dolokhov. "'It will be necessary to go there. "'We can't start the affair without knowing for certain how many there are. "'I like to work accurately. 
Here now, wouldn't one of these young gentlemen like to ride over to the French camp with me? I have brought a spare uniform. I... I'll go with you, cried Petya. There's no need for you to go at all, said Denisov, addressing Dolokov. And for him, I won't let him go on any account. I like that, exclaimed Petya. Why shouldn't I go? Because it's useless. Well, you must excuse me, because... because... I shall go. And that's all. You'll take me, won't you? he said, turning to Dolokov. Why not? Dolokov answered absently, scrutinizing the face of the French drummer boy. Have you had that youngster with you long? he asked Denisov. He was taken today, but he knows nothing. I'm keeping him with me. Yes, and where do you put the others? inquired Dolokov. Where? I send them away and take receipt of them, shouted Denisov, suddenly flushing. And I say boldly that I have not a single man's life on my conscience. Would it be difficult for you to send thirty or three hundred men to town under escort instead of staining, I speak bluntly, staining the honor of a soldier? That kind of amiable talk would be suitable from this young count of sixteen, said Dilokov with cold irony. But it's time you drop it. Why, I have said nothing. I only say that I certainly will go with you, said Petya shyly. But for you and me, old fellow, it's time to drop these amenities, continued Dilokov as if he had found particular pleasure in speaking of the subject which irritated Denisov. Now why have you kept this lad, he went on, swaying his head, because you are sorry for him. Don't we know these receipts of yours? You send a hundred men away, and thirty get there, the rest either starve or get killed. So isn't it the same, not to send them? The Ezeal, screwing up his light-colored eyes, nodded approvingly. That's not the point. I am not going to discuss this matter. I do not wish to take it on my conscience. You say they'll die, all right. It's not by my fault. Dolokov began laughing. Who has told them not to capture these twenty times over? But if they did catch me, they'd string me up to an aspen tree, and with all your chivalry just the same. He paused. However, we must get to work. Tell the Cossack to fetch my kit. I have two French uniforms in it. Well, are you coming with me? He asked Petya. I? Yes, certainly, cried Petya, blushing almost to tears and glancing at Denisov. While Dolokov had been disputing with Denisov what should be done with prisoners, Petya had once more felt awkward and restless. But again, he had no time to grasp fully what they were talking about. If grown-up distinguished men think so, it must be necessary and right, thought he. But above all, Denisov must not dare to imagine that I'll obey him, and that he can order me about. I will certainly go to the French camp with Dolokov. If he can, so can I. And to all Denisov's persuasions, Petya replied that he too was accustomed to doing everything accurately, and not just anyhow, and that he never considered personal danger. For you'll admit that if we don't know for sure how many of them there are, hundreds of lives may depend on it, while well, there are only two of us. Besides, I want to go very much, and certainly will go, so don't hinder me, said he. It will only make things worse. That is the end of War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 8. War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 9, read for LibriVox.org. Having put on French greatcoats and shakos, Petya and Dolokov rode to the clearing from which Denisov had reconnoitred the French camp, and emerging from the forest in pitch darkness, they descended into the hollow. On reaching the bottom, Dolokov told the Cossacks accompanying him to await him there, and rode on at a quick trot along the road to the bridge. Petya, his heart in his mouth with excitement, rode by his side. "'If we are caught, I won't be taken alive. I have a pistol,' whispered he." "'Don't talk Russian,' said Dolokov in a hurried whisper, and at that very moment they heard through the darkness the challenge, "'Who goes there?' and a click of the musket. The blood rushed to Petya's face, and he grasped his pistol. "'Lancers of the Sixth Regiment,' replied Dolokov, neither hastening nor slackening his horse's pace. The black figure of a sentinel stood there on the bridge. Password. Dolokov reined in his horse and advanced at a walk. "'Tell me, is Colonel Gerard here?' Password, repeated the sentinel, barring the way, not replying. When an officer is making his round, sentinels don't ask him for the password. I am asking you if the colonel is here. And without waiting for an answer from the sentinel, who had stepped aside, Dolokov ran up the incline at a walk. Noticing the black outline of a man crossing the road, Dolokov stopped him and inquired where the commander and officers were. 
The man, a soldier with a sack over his shoulder, stopped, came close up to Dolokhov's horse, touched it with his hand, and explained simply, in a friendly way, that the commander and the officers were higher up the hill, to the right, in the courtyard of the farm, as he called the landowner's house. Having ridden up the road, on both sides of which French talk could be heard around the campfires, Dolokhov turned into the courtyard of the landowner's house. Having ridden in, he dismounted and approached a big blazing campfire, around which sat several men talking noisily. Something was boiling in a small cauldron at the edge of the fire, and a soldier in a peaked cap and blue overcoat, lit up by the fire, was kneeling beside it, stirring its contents with a ramrod. "'Oh, he's a hard nut to crack,' said one of the officers, who was sitting in the shadow at the other side of the fire. "'He'll make them get a move on, those fellows,' said another, laughing. Both fell silent, peering out through the darkness, at the sound of Dolokhov's and Petya's steps as they advanced to the fire leading the horses. "'Good day, gentlemen,' said Dolokhov, loudly and clearly. There was a stir among the officers in the shadow beyond the fire, and one tall, long-necked officer, walking round the fire, came up to Dolokhov. "'Is that you, Clement?' he asked. "'Where the devil?' But, noticing his mistake, he broke off short and, with a frown, greeted Dolokhov as a stranger, asking what he could do for him. Dolokhov said that he and his companion were trying to overtake their regiment, and addressing the company in general, asked whether they knew anything of the 6th Regiment. None of them knew anything, and Petya thought the officers were beginning to look at him and Dolokhov with hostility and suspicion. For some seconds all were silent. "'If you were counting on the evening soup, you have come too late,' said a voice from behind the fire with a repressed laugh. Dolokhov replied that they were not hungry and must push farther that night. He handed the horses over to the soldier who was stirring the pot, and squatted down on his heels by the fire, beside the officer with the long neck. That officer did not take his eyes from Dolokhov, and again asked to what regiment he belonged. Dolokhov, as if he had not heard the question, did not reply, but lighting a short French pipe which he took from his pocket, began asking the officer in how far the road before them was safe from the Cossacks. "'Those brigands are everywhere,' replied an officer from behind the fire. Dolokhov remarked that the Cossacks were a danger only to the stragglers, such as his companion and himself, but probably they would not dare to attack large detachments, he asked, inquiringly. No one replied. Well, now he'll come away, Petya thought, every moment, as he stood by the campfire listening to the talk. But Dolokhov restarted the conversation which had dropped and began putting direct questions as to how many men there were in the battalion, how many battalions, and how many prisoners. Asking about the Russian prisoners with that detachment, Dolokhov said, A horrid business dragging these corpses about with one. It would be better to shoot such rabble, and burst into loud laughter so strange that Petya thought the French would immediately detect their disguise, and involuntarily took a step back from the campfire. No one replied a word to Dolokhov's laughter, and a French officer whom they could not see, he lay wrapped in a great coat, rose and whispered something to a companion. Dolokhov got up and called the soldier who was holding their horses. "'Will they be bringing our horses or not?' thought Petya, instinctively drawing near Dolokhov. The horses were brought. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' said Dolokhov. Petya wished to say good night, but he could not utter a word. The officers were whispering together. Dolokhov was a long time mounting his horse, which would not stand still. Then he rode out of the yard at, foot, at a foot pace. Petya rode beside him, longing to look round to see whether or not Frenchmen were running after them, but not daring to. Coming out onto the road, Dolokhov did not ride back across the open country, but through the village. At one spot he stopped and listened. Do you hear? he asked. Petya recognized the sound of Russian voices, and saw the dark figures of Russian prisoners round their campfires. When they had descended to the bridge, Petya and Dolokhov rode past the sentinel, who, without saying a word, paced morosely up and down it. Then they descended into the hollow where the Cossacks awaited them. Well now, goodbye. Cheltenisov at first shot at daybreak, said Dolokhov, and was about to ride away, but Petya seized hold of him. Really, he cried, you are such a hero. Oh, how fine, how splendid, how I love you. All right, all right, said Dolokhov, but Petya did not let go of him, and Dolokhov saw through the gloom that Petya was bending toward him and wanted to kiss him. Dolokhov kissed him, laughed, turned his horse, and vanished into the darkness. That concludes War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 9.
War and Peace, Book 14, Chapter 10, read for LibriVox.org. Having returned to the watchman's hut, Petya found Denisov in the passage. He was awaiting Petya's return in a state of agitation, anxiety, and self-reproach for having let him go. "'Thank God!' he exclaimed. "'Yes, thank God!' he repeated, listening to Petya's rapturous account. "'But, devil take you, I haven't slept because of you. "'Well, thank God. Now lie down, we can still get a nap before morning.' "'But no,' said Petya, "'I don't want to sleep yet. "'Besides, I know myself. If I fall asleep, it's finished. "'And then I am used to not sleeping before a battle.' He sat a while, in the hut, joyfully recalling the details of his expedition and vividly picturing to himself what would happen next day. Then, noticing that Denisov was asleep, he rose and went out of doors. It was still quite dark outside, the rain was over, but drops were still falling from the trees. Near the watchman's hut, the black shapes of the Cossack's shanties and of horses tethered together could be seen. Behind the hut was the dark shapes of the two wagons with their horses beside them, discernible, and in the hollow the dying campfire gleamed red. Not all the Cossacks and hussars were asleep. Here and there, amid the sounds of falling drops and the munching of the horses nearby, could be heard low voices, which seemed to be whispering. Petya came out, peered into the darkness, and went up to the wagons. Someone was snoring under them, and around them stood saddled horses munching their oats. In the dark, Petya recognized his own horse, which he called Karabakh, though it was of Ukrainian breed, and went up to it. Well, Karabakh. "'We'll do some service tomorrow,' said he, sniffing its nostrils and kissing it. "'Why aren't you asleep, sir?' said a Cossack, who was sitting under a wagon. "'No, ah, uh, Likachev, isn't it? Isn't that your name? "'Do you know I have only just come back? We've been into the French camp.' And Petya gave the Cossack a detailed account not only of his ride, but also of his object, and why he considered it better to risk his life than to act just anyhow. "'Well, you should get some sleep now,' said the Cossack. "'No, I am used to this,' said Petya. "'I say, aren't the flints in your pistols worn out? "'I brought some with me. "'Don't you want any? "'You can have some.' "'The Cossack bent forward under the wagon "'to get a closer look at Petya. "'Because I am accustomed to doing everything accurately,' said Petya. "'Some fellows do things just anyhow, without preparation, "'and then they're sorry for it afterwards. "'I don't like that.' "'Just so,' said the Cossack. "'Oh, yes, another thing. Please, my dear fellow, will you sharpen my saber for me? "'It's got bl—' Petya feared to tell a lie, and the saber never had been sharpened. "'Can you do it?' "'Of course I can.' Likachev got up, rummaged in his pack, and soon Petya heard the warlike sound of steel on wet stone. He climbed onto the wagon and sat on its edge. The Cossack was sharpening the saber under the wagon. "'I say, are those lads asleep?' asked Petya. "'Some are, and some aren't, like us.' "'Well, and that boy? Vyaseni? Oh, he's thrown himself down there in the passage, fast asleep after his fright. He was that glad.' After that, Petya remained silent for a long time, listening to the sounds. He heard footsteps in the darkness, and a black figure appeared. "'What are you sharpening?' asked a man, coming up to the wagon. "'Why, this gentleman's saber.' "'That's right,' said the man, whom Petya took to be a hussar. "'Was that cup left here?' "'There, by the wheel.' The hussar took the cup. It must be daylight soon, said he, yawning, and went away. Petya ought to have known that he was in a forest with Denisov's guerrilla band, less than a mile from the road, sitting on a wagon captured from the French beside which the horses were tethered, that under it Likachev was sitting sharpening a saber for him, that big dark blotch to the right was a watchman's hut, that the red blotch below to the left was the dying embers of the campfire that the man who had come for the cup was a hussar who wanted a drink, but he neither knew nor wanted to know anything of all of this. He was in a fairy kingdom where nothing resembled reality. The big dark blotch might really be the watchman's hut, or it might be a cavern leading to the very depths of the earth. Perhaps the red spot was a fire, or it might be the eye of an enormous monster. Perhaps he was really sitting on a wagon, but it might very well be that he was not sitting on a wagon, but on a terribly high tower from which, if he fell, he would have to fall for a whole day, or a whole month, or go on falling and never reach the bottom. Perhaps it was just the Cossack, Likachev, who was sitting under the wagon, but it might be the kindest, bravest, most wonderful, most splendid man in the world, whom no one knew of. 
It might really have been that the hussar came for water and went back into the hollow, but perhaps he had simply vanished, disappeared altogether, or dissolved into nothingness. Nothing Petya could have seen now would have surprised him. He was in a fairy kingdom where everything was possible. He looked up at the sky, and the sky was a fairy realm like the earth. It was clearing, and over the tops of the trees clouds were swiftly sailing as if unveiling the stars. Sometimes it looked as if the clouds were passing, and a clear black sky appeared. Sometimes it seemed as if the black spaces were clouds. Sometimes the sky seemed to be rising high, high overhead, and then it seemed to sink low, so that no one could touch it with one's hand. Petya's eyes began to close, and he swayed a little. The trees were dripping. Quiet talking was heard. The horses neighed and jostled one another. Some snored. Ozek, Zeg, Ozeg, Zeg, hissed the saber against the wet stone, and suddenly Petya heard a harmonious orchestra playing some unknown, sweetly solemn hymn. Petya was as musical as Natasha, and more than Nicholas, but had never learned music or thought about it, and so the melody that unexpectedly came to his mind seemed to him particularly fresh and attractive. The music became more and more audible. The melody grew and passed from one instrument to another, and what played was a fugue, though Petya had not the slightest conception of what a fugue is, each instrument now resembling a violin, now a horn, but better and clearer than a violin or a horn, played its own part, and before it had finished, the melody merged with another instrument that began almost the same air, and then with a third and a fourth, and they all blended into one again and became separate, and again blended, now into solemn church music, now into something dazzlingly brilliant and triumphant. Oh, why? That was in a dream, Petya said to himself as he lurched forward. It's in my ears, but perhaps it's music of my own? Well, go on, my music, now... He closed his eyes, and from all sides, as if from a distance, sounds fluttered, grew into harmonious, separated, blended, and again all mingled, into the same sweet and solemn hymn. Oh, this is delightful. As much as I like, and as I like, said Petya to himself. He tried to conduct that enormous orchestra, now softly, softly die away. And the sounds obeyed him, now fuller, more joyful, still more and more joyful and from an unknown depth rose increasingly triumphant sounds. Now voices join in, ordered Petya, and at first from afar he heard men's voices and then women's. The voices grew in harmonious, triumphant strength, and Petya listened to their surpassing beauty and awe and joy. With a solemn and triumphal march there mingled a song, the drip from the trees and the hissing of the saber, ozek, seg, seg, and again the horses jostled one another and neighed not disturbing the choir, but joining in it. Pieta did not know how long this lasted. He enjoyed himself all the time, wondered at his enjoyment, and regretted that there was no one to share it. He was awakened by Likachev's kindly voice. It's ready, your honor. You can split a Frenchman in half with it. Pieta woke up. It's getting light. It's really getting light, he exclaimed. The horses that had previously been invisible could now be seen to their very tails and a watery light showed itself through the bare branches. Pietya shook himself, jumped up, took a ruble from his pocket and gave it to Likachev. Then he flourished the saber, tested it, and sheathed it. The Cossacks were untying their horses and tightening their saddle girths. And here's the commander, said Likachev. Genisov came out of the watchman's hut and, having called Pietya, gave orders to get ready. End of chapter 10